Hello, all you friends, you neighbors, you family, all the citizens of the world. I'm Michael James. I'm here in Chicago on a cloudy day. And we are about to bring you another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. This will actually be number 134 during the week of during the time of the pandemic. It's for uh, broadcast and uh, streaming on the 7th, and we are recording it on January 4th. Uh, today, I've got a couple of old friends coming on. Uh, Ivan Handler is going to talk to us about biodiversity and climate change and those kind of things. And Karuna Fails, who uh, I met a long time ago and haven't seen her for probably 50 years. Uh, she's going to talk to us about a couple of books and about diversity. Tell us a little bit about Lincoln University in Pennsylvania and growing up there. And uh, a little bit maybe from one of her books uh, on political correctness and how it's not always such a good thing. So stay tuned for a couple of really neat guests. It'll uh, trigger, spark a lot of conversation. And before we get to that point, I'm going to share what we call our opening banter. So. One of the good things was uh, Lula has now uh, become the president. He's sworn in, in uh, down in Brazil. And Bolsonaro, the sort of fascist dude, uh, he has fled to Florida. And who knows how long he'll be there, how long the U.S. lets him stay there. Uh, certainly, there's some potential for him to have to deal with the courts in Brazil. And let me read you a quote that I found from a fellow named Frank Serabino in the Palm Beach Post. He said, we need to set a quota on deposed wannabe dictators re relocating in Florida. If not, we could get a reputation here for being the Elba of the Americas. I know, I know. Florida already has a well-deserved reputation of being a haven for people looking for second chances and for anyone fleeing unsavory situations. Let's be honest. Most of us who have relocated to Florida are refugees from something, cold winters, high taxes, Latin American poverty and crime, ungrateful chicken. Children, not chicken, children. Sorry about that. Anyhow, that's Frank Serabino of the Palm Street Post, Palm Beach Post. Um, another, a little bit of analysis, talking global wars here. Uh, I got this from the New York Times. Putin prepares Russians for a long fight ahead as the anniversary of Russia's invasion looms. Uh, President Vladimir Putin has dropped the pretense that life goes on as normal despite the war. A lot of news out there. It's something you really want to follow. Uh, something I've been following, uh, and it was kind of riveting, and I only have information up until Wednesday morning. But the dysfunctional grand old party, a.k.a. the Republicans, are having a hard time electing a speaker of the House of Representatives, part of the legislative branch of the United States government. Um, as of this morning, there have been four votes and Kevin McCarthy has been unable to secure the 218 votes needed. Uh, some of the right wing demands are not terrible, you know, uh, ability to bring more matters to the House. Uh, bills to the floor, et cetera. But a lot of it has to do with a real distrust for Mc McCarthy. And uh, I've read various things that say people don't like McCarthy. This is personal. It's not a Trump thing. Remember, McCarthy uh, badmouthed Trump and really called him for what he was after the January 6th stuff came down. Uh, but then he went down to Florida and pumped him up and kissed his ass. Uh, so his own people are... Uh, are preventing him from assuming the, the speakership, and we'll see what happens. We are missing Nancy Pelosi already. Okay, let's take a look at the border. Uh, as you many of you know, listen to the show regularly, we, uh, we report on El Paso, we report on things going on the border, and last week we had Jeff Biggers, who was down in Arizona, talking about uh, not only the history of, of uh, Arizona, but uh, the situation on the border in general. Uh, what I came up with for today is uh, uh, the mayor of El Paso declared a de disaster declaration. And the headlines basically say, do the state's actions cross into the federal government's authority to enforce immigration law? 
Uh, the, the U.S. rep for El Paso is Veronica Escobar, and she told El Paso Matters, a great source of information, that she's concerned the state is enforcing immigration law or trying to. She said that she asked the uh, Customs and Border Patrol Acting Commissioner, a fellow named Miller, uh, if the federal agency had requested the state of Texas to help uh, or if the state had requested permission to set up along the Rio Grande. Miller said no to both. And Escobar said, at issue may be whether the barriers are placed on state, federal, or private property. Uh, she said, frankly, what the city requested with their declaration was humanitarian support, not this. And what's been going on is uh, the militarization of the border, um, putting up shipping containers uh, along the border, uh, helping to create a fence along with uh, more concertina, barbed wire, et cetera. Meanwhile, in Arizona, they are removing uh, these barriers on the border uh, because uh, they're, they're removing the shipping containers placed along the U.S.-Mexico border uh, a week after the U.S. government had filed a lawsuit alleging that the makeshift wall designed to deter migrants was placed along the U.S.-Mexico border um, a week after the U.S. government filed a lawsuit allegedly that the makeshift was designed to deter migrants was illegally erected on federal lands. So I got to say, as someone who's uh, been to El Paso a lot, has been there before there were all these fences on the border and after, it's really pretty uninspiring and very sad and kind of tragic that we have a, a country that welcomed immigrants for so long now it erects barriers to keep them out. Uh, you know, you drive along the border now, there are these big steel fences. On the voting front, uh, remember those of you who live in Chicago, and I hope a lot of you in Chicago are listening, get ready. We have two rounds of voting coming up in February. Uh, one in February, one in April. On February 28th, we'll have an election for who will be our next mayor, also who will be our next city clerk, our next city treasurer, and we will also be deciding on all 50 members of the city council, as well as electing 66 members of the newly created police district councils, which will overlook the police and hopefully they are behaving themselves and the community and the police can work together in for really important ways. Uh, on the labor front, um, Hitting the news the last couple of days is news about the health workers at the Howard Brown Health Centers. Um, their workers are out on strike. They warn of more burnout and turnover as the LGBTQ organization has laid off 64 workers. I got this from Block Club Chicago. Uh, employees have accused Howard Brown Health of violating labor law as they push for a union contract and said that the layoffs reduce critical health services for vulnerable people. Organization leaders say they are trying to close a $12 million shortfall. So we probably think that the uh, Howard Brown people, who are people who are running, are well-meaning and good people in a bit of a crunch. But uh, the workers, and very often in progressive outfits, you have the workers even a little bit more to the left pushing them. So let's hope that this thing gets worked out. One of the saddest things that happened this week, and actually for a long time, is uh, to watch on national television on Monday Night Football uh, the, the injury to DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills. Um, clearly, this was really different. I mean, I, every week I'm someone's injured and someone's taken off the field. And having had some injuries in my life, knowing what that's like, I, uh, you know, it just kind of tears you up. This was really different. This was uh, a guy who <laughs> was out. He stopped breathing. They gave him CPR. They brought the ambulances. Eventually, the NFL uh, uh, called the game, and it's not clear when that will be replayed. Uh, just so people know, uh, there are a lot of football injuries, and I'm just going to name a few people who have had either been paralyzed or had career ending uh, or you know spinal injury. Daryl Stingley, who... Um, is the most prominent and is in a wheelchair. Jeff Fuller 
in 89, Mike Utley in 91 of the Detroit Lions, Dennis Bird in 92. I mean, what happened to him? Um, neck and spinal cord, Reggie Brown in 97, uh, Corey Stringer in 2001, Kevin Everett in 2007, uh, Johnny Knox, the Chicago Bear in 2011, and Ryan Shazier of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, you know, this is pretty uh, heavy stuff. And if you want to follow more on football injuries, one of the guests we had this year, Matt Cheney, and if you look him up, Matt Cheney has a lot of information on football injuries as well as steroids. And this is a book he did uh, on Native American people in Missouri and other stories. But remember that name, Matt Cheney. And I would also encourage you to pay attention to David Megacy, our longtime pal. Uh, I think he's going to come on the show in the next week or two to talk about uh, injuries in football. He himself is part of a Harvard study on brain injury after seven years in the pros. He worked with the union. He ran the West Coast office. So uh, we hope he's doing well and we will be talking to him and hopefully he'll be talking to all of you in the weeks to come. On a really sad note, uh, a fellow we got to know through our our friend and uh, sometimes co-host and producer, Katie Hogan. Uh, when I first met Katie, she was working with the Associated Colleges of the Midwest, where young kids from colleges around the Midwest would come in. They work with community organizations, um, and they learned a lot. And one of the people that I met through her was Jody Kressman. Uh, he went on to lead the assets-based community development um, and a book he did about building communities from the inside out. Uh, Jody passed away. He was uh, he had you know worked in collaboration with poor urban communities in large cities in the U.S. and trying to come up with ways that uh, communities and cities and people can work together to improve situations. Jody was a wonderful fellow, and we we're all going to miss him. Uh, last week, uh, I'm going to mention again, uh, you can get to last week's show if you go to youtube.com slash heartlandmedia slash videos. You can also get it uh, when you go uh, to uh, Google and Spotify podca podcast. And last week, we had our co-host sometimes and co-producer sometimes, Tom Clark, on talking with us, and we interviewed Andre Vasquez, the alderman for the 40th Ward, who was really a pretty dynamic fellow. And we also talked with our friend Jeff Biggers, who's put out a lot of books, knows a lot about the border, lived in, uh, you know, south of the border, lives in Iowa, has written a lot of books. And he had some interesting stuff, particularly about immigration and uh, Arizona, a lot of history, and some of it is a progressive history. So I think that's going to be it for the opening banner. I know that our producer, my uh, son, Hal James here, is going to give us a little bit of music. And we'll be back with our first guest, who is a longtime friend, longtime activist here in Chicago, Ivan Handler. And I got an email from him that talked about the critical importance of biodiversity and why it's being ignored in favor of climate change. So I said to him, hey, come on and talk about it. So we'll see what he's got. We'll be right back. We're going to bring on my friend Ivan Handler now. And I'll repeat what I said at the outset of the show because he didn't hear me say it. Um, I've been getting all kind of uh, emails from him over the years. And one of them recently said the critical importance of biodiversity and why it's being ignored in favor of climate change. So I said, let's do a thing. And then I read... And I'm going to read this about the most recent top 15 that was held in Montreal. It said nearly 200 countries have signed off on an agreement that embeds the promotion of human rights and the rights of nature into a plan to protect and restore, to restore biodiversity through 2013. It's a 14-page document, the 12-day conference uh, under the auspices of the UN Convention of Biological Diversity. It is the first international agreement to give credence to a growing movement that recognizes that nature and everything it encompasses, from animal and plant species to rivers, mountains, and the soil, possess inherent rights 
similar to those of human beings. The accord is therefore being hailed by some environmentalists as a watershed moment. Mentions of human rights, indigenous people's rights, local communities' rights, and gender equality are also threaded throughout the document, making a shift from past biodiversity agreements that skirted the human rights issue. Okay, that's a lot in one chunk, but it's pretty clear. We're moving in a good direction, whether or not it'll come to be. We're going to hear what Ivan Handler has to say. Good morning to you, my brother. Actually, hey. afternoon. How you doing, Michael? Good to see you. I'm having a great day. <laughs> well, that's good. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you. I haven't been over there since you were helping me print some photographs a couple of years back, and it yeah. won't be long till I'll probably be back over there. Okay, yeah, well, that's good. I've got to get back into that. I've been trying to con trying to reduce the number of things I'm doing as I'm getting uh, older. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, the biodiversity thing is actually very important. There's some very good things in it, but there's a lot of things missing. And um, I think that's one of the problems. Uh, the government, you know, governments have been making these agreements for years and not living up to them. And that's one of the uh, problems in, in these things. It's nice to have these agreements, but there's no way to actually enforce them. And based on past history, um, it just seems like this is going to be more uh, glad handing, <clears throat> getting um, pats on the back. We need a lot more. It's not that the things that they agree to are bad. Um, I don't think they're sufficient, but they're, you know, good things, especially the rights of uh, not just humans, but of uh, living beings. I think that's very important. Salamanders. Yeah, everything, <laughs> everything, bacteria, viruses, everything that's alive um, needs to, to have some uh, some support. But <clears throat> I think um, the problem is that, especially in the West, we divide things up between economics, politics, science and research, agriculture. We have all these different boundaries. These boundaries are, in fact, not natural. If you look at ecosystems, the ecosystems, everything's integrated. There aren't those kinds of boundaries. And I claim that one of the reasons we're in this crisis of destroying the biosphere, the human supporting biosphere, is because we've imposed these boundaries and these boundaries have been imposed primarily so we can have more control. And in particular, because of the kind of economies we have, we can make more profits. Um, there's no way that I can see that we can have a biodiverse planet that supports human life and these kinds of boundaries, large tracts of land being dedicated to either um, people living or for agriculture. They don't make any sense. They don't make sense ecologically. And in fact, as far as I understand, aside from Western culture, most cultures never actually adapted this uh, craziness. This is um, something that has arisen um, from the West, um, from this very individualistic um, approach. This, I, the Bible puts it up in, the, in Genesis. You know, we're, God gave us the planet to do with whatever we want to do with it. And we unfortunately have. <clears throat> So well, that's um, too bad. I, I actually, uh, I think there was some resistance from certain countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo and a number of other places. Uh, you know, one of the issues is if we're going to make any steps toward whether it be in uh, you know, climate change or, or improving biodiversity, um, who's going to pay for it? And a lot of these places were that have been impacted by the industrialization of the Western world, mostly. Um, they they're saying who's going to pay for it and they held out but they got some concessions uh this is not the first convention that dealt with this no. there have been a number of them and um i don't know where we're going for why don't you start by talking a little bit about uh what is biodiversity and what sure. is climate change and you counterpose them i think obviously we're going to have to work on both of them yes uh, no i don't think they're counterposed it's just um I think that there's a misunderstanding that's going around so that if we manage to keep the global temperature average um, below 1.5 degrees centigrade from where it was about 100 years ago, that things will be OK. <clears throat> and the reality is they won't. I don't um, think things. there's some people saying that things are not going to be OK no matter what we do. That we've gone too far. We've lost it. 
I think that's a good possibility. Um, I'm, of the, um, I'm of the approach that uh, opinion that um, we need to uh, we need to be optimistic and we need to fight, as, assuming that we can uh, survive. Um, but we're in extreme danger. There's no question we're in extreme danger. Um, but let's talk about biodiversity. Let me just read something that I think is really good. Um, so Vandana Shiva is one of the um, most important of the uh, advocates for agri what's called uh, regenerative agriculture. <laughs> and um, a lot of really important things happen in India right now. <laughs> but her definition of biodiversity, I think, is uh, is really good. It's in this book, um, Agroecology and Regenerative Agri Agriculture. It's by Vandana Shiva. <laughs> and, and she's um, really a great person <laughs> and does a lot of work in this area. So she says, Biodiversity represents the variety of plants, animals, and microorganisms in the world, along with their ecological functions and the relationships between them. The higher the diversity and the more multidimensional its ecological functions, the more stable and sustainable the system is, and the higher the goods and services it can provide. So that's biodiversity. <clears throat> um, what I want to do is point out that biodiversity comes about because of natural selection. And um, natural selection is what Darwin um, pointed out was the way that life, if, I mean, it actually is life, it's the way that life evolves. So natural selection has two important components that relate to biodiversity. The first component is variation. Beings, living beings, live in populations that are diverse. None of us are identical to each other. We all, all have even though a lot of similarities have variation built in, none of our genetic genes are ever exactly a match. <clears throat> so there's this enormous amount of variation. And then there's something called selection, which selection means is the <clears throat> creatures, the populations evolve in ways that um, are the most ad advantageous for them. I guess that's the best way to put it. <clears throat> so that <clears throat> not everything survives. And what happens as a result is that the actual frequencies of different components in a population vary over time. That's what evolution is. The problem, I mean, so biodiversity, therefore, is about natural selection. It's about improving the diversity of life so that selective pressures can come down and keep things moving forward. The problem with the way that we do agriculture in particular, but the way we look at the world is that we look at the world through these very narrow lenses that come about through our technology, and that is not diverse <clears throat> at all. And in particular with agriculture, we have the problem of what's called monocultures. So in normal, if you look at a lot of <clears throat> non-Western cultures, you will see all kinds of polyculture, you know, different plants and animals being grown together in a sustainable way. When you get to the West, all of a sudden, you have these huge tracts of land, monocultures, you destroy diversity. <clears throat> and when you destroy diversity, you're attacking the basis of life to reproduce itself. So biodiversity is critical. <clears throat> we can't survive without it. And the relationship with climate change is the following. First off, Climate change also hurts biodiversity, right? I mean, as as temperatures get wilder, going um, either hotter or colder, as the weather changes, the kinds of adaptations that have already happened get hurt. And that's problematic and scary. So that's one of the critical things to understand about biodiversity and climate change. Biodiversity, I mean, climate change is going to be dealt with. I'm convinced that we're going to have eventually renewable energy, whether it's the kind of renewable energy we want, whether it's, going to, you know, whether it's going to be technology intensive, which also causes environmental damage, or we move it to a more biologically based one. You know, I'm not sure. Um, but climate change can be, I believe, addressed in a, some kind of way. Biodiversity in the last 200 years, last 50 years, We've done so much damage to biodiversity, it will be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years before that comes back. Biodiversity is a bigger problem. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just thinking about, you know, there's a lot of talk about how many species are disappearing every year. 
uh, clearly, we, you know, it's a problem. And so if you are correct, and I hope you are, that we'll figure a way to deal with climate change in some form or fashion, that doesn't necessarily address biodiversity. Think right. about the, the, uh, the, the clearing of the rainforest in Brazil, which has been an issue. How, how much clearing has been done and at what points does it meet, make a kind of a qualitative leap so that you cannot bring it back? or you cannot recreate it. Um, I'm reminded of our friend who's been on the show and many of you out there who listen to the show have eaten some of the buffalo that was uh, raised by uh, Wild Idea Buffalo, a guy named Dan O'Brien. And one of the things that attracted me to him when we at the Heartland were selling buffalo meat, um, you know, the, the one mean buffalo burger, which was our largest, you know, item on the menu, was he talked about- bringing back the buffalo onto, and he did it on his, his ranch that he had, uh, it, the buffalo pound the earth. It brings back more grasses, more insects, more birds, more small animals. It recreates the prairie. You know, the, and so if you look online under buffalo, there's a lot of people raising buffalo, a lot of people trying to do the good thing. But that's just an example of, of a step that could help uh, bring, you know, protect biodiversity or bring it back. But right. I don't know of other ways to do it and what's out there. What do you got? Well, that's what I think is, is critical. But I think, see, I my view is the glo Gaia, the global ecology is not just an ecological model. It's a social model. We need to reorganize. Gaia, the, tell tell people about Gaia again. So, um, Lovelock and uh, Lynn Margulis, who was... Um, <clears throat> Uh, married to uh, Carl Sagan at one time, came up with this idea that the planet itself is a self-regulation, self-regulating superorganism. Now, some scientists will get in back and forth around this, but I think at least from a conceptual point of view, that's how we should see, you know, when we talk about Mother Earth, that's what we're talking about as a system that's cohesive and integrated. What we have in human culture is, is, is systems that are disaggregated, <clears throat> at comp competing with each other, <clears throat> you know, polluting the planet. It's the wrong model. The social model is the right model, but that means um, no more big farms. It means, um, <clears throat> you know, we've got to have small little farms, small farmers coming back. We need communities. We need to start building communities. And in, including in the city, I'm I'm big on urban agriculture. I think we need more of that. We need local ecologies in the city. Why not bring the prairie back to Chicago? I mean, in some ways, they're starting to do that. If you look at the prairie restoration in Montrose, which yeah. I love, we need a lot more of that. And we need to start focusing on ecological concepts, small communities, small little integrated environments that ally with each other. I mean. It's is a big problem. Um, one of the things you may not know, uh, my friend Harry Rhodes, who was the um, executive director of a Growing Home, um, he's now working in, in, in actually with farm animals. He went to Cuba about 10 years ago. Um, in Cuba right now, half of the produce that they eat in Cuba, in, in Havana, is grown in Havana. Um, some of that started because um, Dick Levins and Science for the People in the 70s went down to Cuba because they were obviously hurting and trying to figure out a way to help them produce food. <laughs> so that's an example of the kinds of things that we need to do. It's not at all enough. And that's the other thing I want to mention is scientific research. We don't we're not putting enough money into scientific research because you know we're putting more money into military. We should be putting all of that money plus a whole lot more into scientific research because we actually don't understand much. I know it looks like we understand a lot with all of our technology, but if you look at what we understand about biology, we don't know that much. We're in incredible danger and we're spending money <clears throat> building weapons and having, you know, fights around who gets to comp you know, who gets to build what computer chips. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> so we need to pull way back and start looking at what this means in a deep sense. And I think right now, especially for revolutionaries or people who are progressive, we need to get moving um, without the governments, because governments have clearly shown that they're they're too much in the hands of special interests, capitalist interests that aren't going to let us, don't want to do anything. So we need to take the initiative and, and the lead 
which has been happening for years. I mean, I'm feeling optimistic about this, even though we're in quite a dangerous position. But I think my view is people as a whole want to survive. Humanity is going to survive. And we just have to keep on focusing on getting it together. And I hope we do. I hope we can get it together so we can all stay on Earth and don't have to be living on Mars or on a moon or something like that. <laughs> Uh, I'm happy to have Ellen Musk go to Mars. Let's get rid of him <laughs> and, and Bezos. And There's uh, uh, our friend Carol Travis, who was on not too long ago, talking about her dad and the Flint strikes uh, right. back in the old days in the 30s. But Carol's living in North Carolina, and uh, she just sent me an email that uh, brought up a, an organization called Regenerative Rising. And that would be Regenerative Rising, as it's spelled, .org, if you want to find out more of them. And then yeah, when you piqued my interest in this, uh, you know, and I'm always paying attention to some animals disappearing, that kind of thing. Um, I sent you an article by Susan Susan Samard, uh, who made key discoveries on how fungal networks sustain healthy forests is now pushing logging reform. And uh, that's an article by Susan Kaplan in the Washington Post. Um, we got a couple minutes left, maybe one or two. Why don't you uh, give us some parting well, shots? On I would say, uh, I, yeah, I think, I mean, what I'm interested in, and I think we all need to do, is to figure out how to integrate our political activism with the environmental movement. It should be part of everything that we do. We shouldn't be, we should not be, you know, making these boundaries. We should be attacking them. And I think part of it is also, getting the public to understand that we need citizen scientists. It's not sufficient. Scientists can't go off in a lab and figure out what needs to be done. It needs to happen in the field, and it needs to happen with farm workers and people like us who are in the field, who are living the life. We need to be part of what's going on. We need a different kind of science if we're going to manage to get somewhere, because the kind of science that breaks up everything <clears throat> into small little chunks it's great for publishing, you know, papers and stuff like that. But and it's not that it's, you know, not that it, obviously it's yielded a lot of important results. But given our current crisis, we need science to become a lot more public and have a lot more public participation. Just like medicine, it's another thing I'm working on is something called the Society for Participatory Medicine. We shouldn't have people, you know, healthcare is very much the same. You should be participating in your healthcare. You shouldn't be just sitting back passively while the doctor tells you what they're going to do. Well, so, we got to, yeah. we have to, you know, figure a way to to light up a coevolutionary relationship between the human species and the living planet. And uh, I'm glad you got us going on this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it's something we're going to look at. And I know you're working on a major piece. Uh, for uh, I think a magazine called Unity, yeah, Not Unity twenty twenty two, Unity twenty twenty two dot com. Yeah, it's it, we had a revolutionary rag in the eighties. Some you may or may not remember it, but we're <laughs> trying to come back. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're um we're older and we're trying to just come back and provide some new ideas for younger activists. That's one of the things. It's very much in line with what you and uh, Katie and others have been doing for years and years and years. Well, Ivan Handler, this is great. Do you want to give someone a way to get a hold of you if they want to pursue uh, more discussion with you, et cetera? Um, Ivan.Handler at gmail.com. Well, you're a wonderful guy, and I love running into you, and I'm glad you send me emails that provoke my thought processes. And uh, you, you're you raising a really important issue, you know? And uh, I, uh, I went even after reading some of the stuff that you've been sending, I went looking for an old Coevolution quarterly t-shirt, but I couldn't find one. And I don't know where mine went to, but I like the idea of, uh, you know, people working to save the planet. And uh, you're one of the guys that's on it and you're reminding the rest of us. So I thank you. And I know you're going to be doing good in the world. So thanks, Ivan. And thank everyone you, else, stay tuned here on the left end of the dial or at youtube.com slash heartland media slash videos or at Spotify or Google Podcast. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with a little bit more Live from the Heart. And then we're going to bring on another old friend, Corinna Fales, talking about community organizing, talking about Lincoln University, talking about political correctness, et cetera. Be right back. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Okay, welcome back to a little bit more of Live from the Heartland for January 7th. This is number 134 uh, during the pan time, since the beginning of the pandemic. 
And I want to, I'm really glad to be bringing on somebody who I've always loved her name. I, when I first saw the name Corinna, it reminded me of Corinna, Corinna, that song, which I used to sing when I was playing the guitar. And I got to meet uh, Corinna Fails. Uh, she was a community organizer working with the Newark Community Union Project back in 1965. I was involved with Students for Democratic Society, as was she, I believe. And uh, SDS had these economic research and action projects where they encouraged uh, students to go into poor and working neighborhoods and organize for change. Um, and I worked in uh, Joint Community Union. Corinna worked at the Newark Community Union Project. And uh, I don't know if I met her in Newark or if I met her at the Poor People's Conference in 65 or if we met at an SDS reunion, but we're both on an SDS list where people do a lot of emailing back and forth. And I put it out there that, okay, you old comrades, I'm looking for more guests. And she responded. She sent me her books. This one, uh, Different, was about growing up at Lincoln University. So I'm going to ask her to share a little bit about NCUP, the Newark Community Union Project, and then we'll move on to not only one, but two of her books. Good morning to you. <laughs> oh, wow. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> afternoon. It's afternoon. It's good to see you after all these years. <laughs> likewise. Likewise. What a treat. Thank you for having me. Well, tell us about, uh, just for the, I like to think that there's young organizers who are learning about uh, what we did. You know, we looked to Alinsky and the labor movement for our community organizing efforts back in the day. Uh, tell us a little bit about your time at Newark and what that was at NCUP. Uh, okay, and I still have friends, by the way, there. So it was a very um, long-term relationship with some of those folks because uh, they've been friends for 60 years now. We're still in touch, um, the ones that are alive. Um, and we, uh, what shall I say? I was organizing around uh, a single issue, which was I was assigned a, a couple of blocks of an area, and the common issue for everybody there was the truck traffic and the lack of a stop light. Um, and so their kids were getting hurt and killed. It was a mess, um, and there was a lot of energy behind trying to get a, a stop light. Um, and a lot of people, if you, if you, I don't know, Mike, if you've seen the movie Troublemakers, there's a scene where. Okay, that's my block. <laughs> Those people were people that I organized, actually, even though I'm not, you don't see me in the film. I mean, at that point, it sort of, it went differently and the project wanted somebody to come in who was um, black and sort of a, a speaker with a megaphone, which is not my style. And so, do you, know, you see the people on the street with all that going on, but actually I was the one that put it all together. And it did eventually, I mean, the city of Newark stonewalled us. Um, it did eventually fall apart. Whereas in the white, one of the white sections, um, people just simply signed a petition and got a stoplight. Um, so you could see all the difference in the world. But I, if as an organizer, and this might sound, I'm, I'm not floofy or airy fairy, but honestly, if I had to say one thing as an organizer, because I'm not a strategist and I actually don't know that I want to try to be a straight. It's just not, it's not me. Um, as an organizer, you have to love people that honestly, it makes all the difference. <laughs> um, and I did, and, you know, and I was a very successful organizer. I have to say, I'm just, I'm not, you know, the speaker at the top. Well, I'm speaking now, but I wasn't in those days, especially in the male dominated SDS, which you know about, um, you know, I wasn't that much of a strategist, but in terms of organizing and getting people together without the love, good luck. Well, you had guys like Tom Hayden there for a while, and I don't ever know what happened to Barry Kalish and, and Betty. Uh, they came to Oakland and worked with us in the Oakland Community Project. Uh, but Betty, I, Betty, Betty, who? I don't remember. It was an African American woman who was running with Barry Kalish. Well, guess what? Can I say something? <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever just, you want. I spoke to Betty yesterday. Wow. My, my next book <laughs> is planned to be about Betty, who has fostered 14 children extremely successfully. And I want to call it Betty's gift because I want to know what did she do when she got those kids out of really terrible circumstances. And every one of them is in terrific shape. 
And you can love your kids. A lot of, you know, people do, but that doesn't mean they can successfully do that. So actually, Betty and I are in touch all the time. I just got an updated photo of her. That's what I mean. These are long, <laughs> these are long-term relationships. Well, if you've got an address or find anything about Barry, I'd love to uh, talk to him again. Okay, uh, well, we, we discussed Barry. I can talk to you separately, yeah. that, but Betty uh, and I said something yesterday. When I, after you, we we connected again, you sent me a couple of books and I learned a lot of things about you. I had no idea about any of this. Uh, you went on to live in, after Newark, I think you went and lived in Harlem for about 25 years. Now you're in North Carolina, you're working on, uh, you're an author, a writer, editor, a speaker, um, and, uh, you know, you facilitate discussions about race and uh, community, uh, but you also grew up in Lincoln at Lincoln University, uh, which is an African-American school. It's the first historically black college, I guess, that gave degrees. Cheney State was a little before, but um, I had never heard of uh, Lincoln University and knew nothing about it until I was reading Oliver Cox, my monthly review copy of a book that was originally a double day, 1946, Cast, Class, and Race by Oliver Cox. And he was at Lincoln University. So how about you talk a little bit about Lincoln University, because it's a great story. And then you did a book, which is basically a, a collective memoir of people who grew up there or lived there. Take it away, <laughs> Corinna. <laughs> well, it was I had a lot of gifts in my life and a lot of hard times, but one of my gifts was growing up in Lincoln University, and especially when I did, which is when the first Black president was in office. Julian Bond, some of you may know his name, his dad was the president at the time that I grew up there on the campus. And my dad taught there. My parents are um, Jewish refugees from Hitler. Their families were murdered. And they raised me, uh, he was a professor of philosophy, my father, and raised me um, at that time, faculty was all on the campus. So I used to go to sleep to hearing the Glee Club sing at night and beautiful songs and Einstein came to speak and Thurgood Marshall went there and Marian Anderson came to sing. And I mean, it was just extraordinary um, place. It had most stops on the um, Underground Railroad, I think of anywhere. They're right on campus that people knew where some of the places were. And it was just, and we had the largest African contingent anywhere in the country. So it was just a tremendously vibrant and dynamic place to grow up. Um, and really pretty much, there were a couple of other white families and kids, but really all my close friends were black. Um, and so that was just an experience in itself. For example, when Emmett Till was murdered, and his photographs were in Jet Magazine. I was with an all black group of friends looking at those pictures. So it goes way back for me and very deep. Um, and also I just wanna say this, cause I wouldn't have written that book without the next experience, which is that my dad died when I was eight. And then we really went into poverty and we moved to the adjoining community, um, which was literally and figuratively across the railroad tracks. And, you know, a chicken foot soup and stuff like that. Um, and I it was very hard on me, but I'm super grateful for that part because I got to live literally on both sides of the tracks and live in a whole other very poor rural community that was very uneducated, formally speaking, and had a whole other set of experiences. And without that, I wouldn't I wouldn't be me. So when I went to Newark, I was like I was home. You know, I was yeah. just like, totally <laughs> home. Was like, everybody was like, how does she do it? And I thought, well, y'all didn't grow up the way I did. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that I knew none of that. And I, I, it's, it's pretty impressive in the, the stories. You know, I read uh, chunks of this book and I read uh, Yvonne Foster and her friend Susie Grubb. And uh, Susie, I guess, from a white family, she either did a debutante thing or something and didn't tell her other for Yvonne. And, there was growing apart and people coming together. Tell us a little stories about th this book. I mean, you, you've you got interviews with a lot of people and including Julian Bond, who some of the younger folks, some people may not know. Tell us a little bit about growing up with Julian Bond. Well, he was fun. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was a little, 
he's just scare us and Halloween and stuff. I mean, you know, I know him personally, not as a, you know, historic figure, um, or also as a historic, he was actually waiting for the book to come out and he kept saying, Corona, where is the book? And I said, I said, I tell you what, I'll give you an advanced copy if you give me like a testimonial. And he said, sure. And literally he dropped dead two days later. Um, so that was, yeah, that was crazy timing, but um, I mean, the, the, it, Julian is part of, you know, what draws people who know his name to the book. But in fact, I was looking at the entire community and the entire social community. Um, and the interviews include the son of the county boss, who was white um, and who was whose dad was well known to be in the KKK. And or I should say reputed, but locally, yeah. yes. Um, and and his white son was the only white child in the all otherwise all black school. So how did that happen? So there are just a lot of stories of, and then there's Yvonne and Susie looking at the same issues, you know, from different perspectives. I learned a lot because I thought I knew a lot. Um, and I found out 50 years later when I went back and interviewed them that there was so much I didn't know. Um, and the white kids were raised to be colorblind and the black kids were like, uh uh-uh. uh, uh, and that was that was you know one of the big things. So I just learned a tremendous amount, and I think the model. What I'm I'm just proud of it because not from eat me, but because people. It's an honest book. The, the, everybody in their interviews is honest. There's no political correctness. There's no this. There's no that. There's straight up real talk. And to me, it's a model of how we need to be speaking now that we aren't speaking. So I really I cherish everybody for for giving me their their real selves, you know, and and being open. Well, you've been talking about uh, starting to do more speaking on diversity. And uh, I had some notes here. I say there's a lot of in our country, there's a lot of talk about diversity these days, equity and inclusion. But in a lot of ways, we well, clearly we haven't practiced it. And uh, how do we develop uh, real and open conversations about diversity and bring about some real change? You got a plan for that? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I want to hear. Gonna, and I'm only going to reveal part of it because I'm in this. I'm literally writing talks for what I hope are paid speaking gigs because I may be old, but I have to keep working. I can't retire. So I I'm, know not that feeling. All away. I'm not going to give it all away, but I'm not where you think I might stand coming from sort of a, the, my background. Um, I think political correctness has been maybe well-intentioned, I'm not sure it ever was, but big mistake. I one of, the, one of the issues is this, and I won't give you the whole nine yards, but <laughs> science is clear that the reason we have, we have an aversion to diversity, to difference, it's in our DNA. And until we deal with that piece, for starters, we're not gonna come up with good solutions. Because people don't want, I don't know why that's not in the common, it's not the common narrative, but it's been clear for quite a while from studying babies as little as three months old. Um, and it's in my talk. And so the question is, start with the truth. If you don't start with the truth, as a student of social policy, I was taught, you know, you have, but it's just, it's, it's common sense. If you don't analyze something correctly, you're not gonna come with a way to deal with it. And PC is, this problem starts in our brain. It's like in our brain stems. It's the primitive part of our brain. And it's in us the same way it's in animals, you know, to be wary of difference, to be careful, to be, it's for our survival as a species. And so there is no help to call it bad does not help. The question is, you say, okay, we have this thing in us. How do we deal with it? And I will go so far as to say one of the problems is that what political correctness has done, and I don't mean by that, I, I'm for addressing everybody the way they want to be addressed. So that's not what I'm speaking of what it's become, which I think you know what I mean. Um, but it is a purely mental construct designed to solve a problem that's in the mind to begin with. And it's like fighting fire with fire. It will get nowhere except it breeds resentment. Um, you're already seeing the backlash. I get it, frankly. Um, and so the question is, you know, what what will work and what can work instead? And I do. I have. I'm writing a speech now 
where I make three points saying, here's what anybody can do. Anybody who wants to make this choice can make this choice and make a difference. But it's not what's being done in leftist progressive PC circles at all. <laughs> so I just, yeah, I, I find it really sad and very disturbing and very divisive. And I and I really get why people resent it. Well, it's I, you know, I understand how uh different animals, different species can be wary of each other. I also like to watch new uh, you know, those things on not Facebook, but the reels where you got a pig and a duck little, you know, playing together. They don't they don't fight, you know. So that's that's optimism for me. But I I've always said we have the as a human being, this human species has the ability to reason, to think, to create, to love, to be free. So how do we go beyond the internal or the, the DNA makeup that keeps us from trusting, being open to others so that we can have a way that the, the, the different groups of people, uh, et cetera, can get along on the planet? <laughs> I'm not giving you my secret yet. <laughs> OK. Because because I'm trying to hold this, but but you do think it's possible, and you're working on it. I'm working on it, and also, I mean, familiarity often breeds comfort, as it did for me growing up with Lincoln. But for example, I can say this because Betty's in the talk. The woman you just we spoke to, Betty, the African American woman. Yeah. Um, Betty lives in her her neighborhood has become totally African, um, and she has a lot of problem with the Nigerians. And so we talk about what that is about. So familiarity doesn't always work. There's other things that have to be done, but they're, you're still in the way that you describe it, Mike, you're still coming from your head though. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it for a minute. It's well, like I've been to the gym already today. I've been to the pool. I went to physical therapy for my shoulders, <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I am in my head and my heart. So well, right. But see, now you might want to think about your heart. Because that is a different way to solve a problem. That is a different way to go about a problem. And and it leads to, I mean, people have said that, you know, all over from Martin Luther King. I mean, change, it's a question of how does change happen and what change happens. And frankly, I don't know change that happens by people being rational and changing their minds. That's just not what you see. You don't see, that's very rare. I have one friend who's like, Oh, you got to have oh. economic forces. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a much deeper issue than just saying, oh, well, yeah, no, I see maybe all those people aren't so bad. And so I'm going to completely change. That is really, really rare. What's usual is you grow up a certain way, you stay in that route, um, you don't get out of it. And, you know, and how do you get out of it? And your brain makes a lot of judgments about people and it's supposed to. Um, that's what it's there for. It can't, it, helping us with this, no. It's not how change happens. So it's a whole question to me of how change happens. And it's one reason I'm not the usual SDSer, as we can say. I have gone a different route. But you would still, you're still for people getting along, right? And in communities. I, I don't, not only am I for it, I think we will die if we don't. I mean, yeah, I think- that, Well, that's there. my point. So I'm gonna wait until your book is closer to coming out and you're coming back on the show and you're going to give us the, the, you know, the pathway to peace and harmony. <laughs> it's really not. I mean, it literally just got clear to me a couple of days ago. I was working on this and working on this and working on this. And I suddenly went, Oh, you know how something gets clear and it's so simple. And you go, why wasn't this clear before? But it just wasn't. And now Can you it give us a, a, a hint, a secret word. That we Yo, could I already did. On. I already did. All right, I'll I'll, have to re I'll watch this when we. Sorry, uh, but I mean, person, I, I really appreciate. You know, I'm just trying to be a little self-preservative, which is not something I've done well in my life. <laughs> I, I have not not done that one well. So I'm I'm trying to just be careful that somebody doesn't say, "Oh, well, you already told somebody that, so we're not going to have you come." So okay. I'm just right in the middle. So please forgive me because I love you and I appreciate being on. No, this is good. And I've got friends in North Carolina. I'm going to try to hook you up because you guys oh. would like each other. Oh, uh, good. Some, I love uh, that. I've had a yeah. hard time finding community here. So that would be wonderful. Thank you. Marina Fails, you're one hell of an interview. And uh, <laughs> you've got a great lot of experiences that you're sharing. And we're waiting for the, the secret uh, pathway 
to peace and harmony and universal uh, love and respect. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so thank how much you time? So much. Thank you so much, and we'll <laughs> we'll be in touch. <laughs> okay, I appreciate you. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> You've been listening to the live from the Heartland show. We'll be back again next week. Uh, this one was for the week of January seventh. Um, on the 14th, uh, we'll be back, and uh, I want to thank everybody who's helped make the show possible, particularly Hal James, Katie Hogan, Tom Clark, the people over at uh, WLUW, our home base, Lynn Orman Weiss, and uh, all of the guests. Today we had Corinna Fales and Ivan Handler. So we encourage y'all to do good in the world. Because the world definitely needs all the good that you do, that I do, that all of us do together. All power to the people.